Hi, um, welcome to episode three of Stories of the Four Courts Slidecast. And what I would like to talk about today um, is the history of the buildings at 145 to 151 Church Street, as reported in the newspapers in the 19th and early 20th centuries. So I'll just show you the buildings that I'm talking about. Uh, Church Street is a long street that runs down from Constitution Hill, where King's Inns are, to uh, the River Liffey, and on the way it goes past the Four Courts. And as we journey through the history of Church Street, we're going to go downhill too, because the numbering is downhill, so it's easier if we follow that route. So what you see here is just Google Street View, and uh, the building that we're passing here is the Law Library Building on Church Street, 145 to 151 Church Street. It's the larger of the two law library buildings on Church Street. And um, what uh, you can see here just at the very end, the side of the four courts, and then after that, the River Liffey. So let me show you the spot that I'm talking about just on an overhead view. So you see a number of buildings here. Uh, round down here is the law library on this side. Um, and it, that's St. Mitchin's Church. Then there's another new building here, and this is the building I'm talking about, 145 uh, to 151 Church Street. So if we were to look at a map from the 19th century, uh, you would see here um, a street called May Lane. So this is May Lane, and these are the buildings 145 uh, to 151 Church Street, starting with 145 here and going to 151. And that reflects the Law Library building today. This section here, you can see the Capuchin Church up here and you can see St. Mitchin's down there. So that's how they were in the 1870s. So going to go back a little bit in time. And this is a very old map from 1610. It's a map by John Speed of Church Street. And again, you can see St. Mitchin's Church here. And you can see all these houses just running along the street up towards King's Inns. King's Inns isn't there yet. So if you're going up the hill, but that is now Constitution Hill. And uh, you can see there's no sign of the Capuchin Church there because it's only 1610. But St. Mitchin's, which is a very old church, is there at that time. And I suppose if we were going to locate the Law Library buildings at 145 to 151 Church Street, they would be about here. I mean, there's no sign of May Lane at this stage at all. You just have a row of houses here. And they would have been, these ones here in the row would have been the original 145 to 151 Church Street. And these would have been Dutch billies, and uh, they would have been like the Dutch billies that you find in Cork Street in Dublin. They would have been in that house style. So shortly after this map, St. Mitchell's became a very, very wealthy parish. And this map here, which was done by John Rock in the mid 19th century, showing May Lane, which is the street that runs down beside the Law Library building. And uh, you can see here just this area of buildings here, that is the, the site of the current Law Library building. So quite a lot of houses there. You can see the Capuchin Friary in Bow Street. And then you have running down, you've 145, uh, 146, 147, 148, 149, 150, and 151 uh, Church Street. So they're the original buildings as shown in Rock's map. You can also see that there are houses at the back of Bow Street that back onto the houses in Church Street. And in between these two houses, there are little courts. And in one of these courts, there was a dairy yard, in fact, as we'll see. So that's May Lane there. And uh, then you have Church Street. So uh, this is, again, the map that's a little bit later. I'm sorry, it's a little bit small here. But again, you can see this area here where the Law Library building is, the Capuchin Church up there, May Lane running along here. So again, we're looking at this area. And although it has been simplified a little bit since Rock's map of 1777, uh, it isn't hugely changed in configuration. But what has changed a lot between uh, the uh, 18th century and the 19th century uh, is the character of Church Street, because Church Street was very, very wealthy in the 18th century, as was Smithfield. It was very popular with a lot of wealthy residents, not just in Henrietta Street, but scattered throughout the Church Street area. So you had a lot of well-off merchants who lived above the shop, 
very comfortable quarters above their prosperous businesses. You had the aristocracy up in Henrietta Street and even some aristocracy down in Smithfield. But things all changed in the late 18th century because after the Act of Union, uh, the uh, commercial business, the business community in Dublin became significantly less wealthy and particularly affected the Church Street area. And also around this time, the aristocracy largely moved out of Ireland or to the extent they stayed, the wealthy people moved to the south side. They moved to Merrion Square and uh, Fitzwilliam Square rather than uh, the, the north side squares. So this was a declining area throughout the 19th century. And in the early 19th century, there was a mix of people. So there were a lot of people still there who were quite well off not aristocracy, but merchants. They were quite well off merchants whose business was in the area and chose to continue living there with their families because they'd always done so. But you also had a lot of poor people moving in, particularly after the famine. And in the first part of the 19th century, whenever you found people uh, referred to as being residents of Church Street, and they had some say over the matter, they usually describe themselves as the respectable residents of Church Street. So, for instance, you had meetings of people to support Daniel O'Connell, and they always describe themselves as the respectable residents. So that indicates certainly that there was a change in composition of the area, and um, the original residents felt that the area was not as, as, as attractive to them as it was, or they wouldn't need to make this distinction. And certainly later on in the 19th century, the area became very poor indeed. But we we'll talk about that uh, in, in due course anyway. So you do have in, when you look at the history to newspaper articles, you do have a decline in the Church Street area, which is odd in a way, because you, know, you would have expected that given that the four courts were situated down the road in 1796, you would imagine that the area would be kind of benefiting from that because it was not a competition about where the forecourts should be placed because people thought, you know, they wanted it near their own land because they thought its value would be enhanced. But because the opening of the forecourts in 1796, because it coincided with the Act of Union, that didn't happen because you had this economic decline in Ireland afterwards and Church Street didn't really benefit at all from the forecourts being there very little. So if we go back again and we have a look then at this building we're talking about, which is this building here, 145 to 151 Church Street. I'm just going to go through uh, each of the houses and the history we have and them, starting with this area here, which is on the right, and it's beside the church, um, uh, uh, the, the Capuchin Church. And uh, you can see there uh, this block here, and that is where 145 Church Street would have been. So we don't have very much information at all on 145 Church Street. It's a bit of a mystery. There's not a huge amount of newspaper reports of it. But we do have a little story, quite a sad story, on the next property here, which is 146 Church Street. So we round about here at 146 Church Street. It'd be extending into where the arbitration centre is today. So um, this, um, date, this story um, dates from the mid 19th century. So we might just go back and we might maybe have a look uh, at uh, the mid 19th century um, in uh, Church Street and what was, was um, uh, happening there. So if we go back to the map, uh, that I, I, I showed you earlier. So we just go back to this, which is 1870, it might be a little bit uh, later than this event, but there probably wasn't a huge change um, in the configuration of uh, the, the properties um, at that time. But the year that I'm talking about is uh, 1851, which would have been about 20 years or so before this act. And it relates to 145 Church Street and uh, which would be round about here. And there was a dairy yard in, or sorry, 146 Church Street. There was a dairy yard in 146 Church Street. And you can kind of see this open space in the map. There was a dairy yard there um, in the, uh, in the um, uh, mid 19th century. And uh, the, the, uh, the, it wasn't unusual to have dairies in the city. So for instance, this is a picture of a dairy in London from about the same time that supplied a lot of milk to Highgate. 
But and dairies were obviously very attractive areas for children because you know they could see animals and so forth. So you know local children would visit a city dairy quite often. But unfortunately, uh, this poor nine-year-old boy who went to visit this dairy that was in 146 Church Street, so round about here, so it looks to have been in this open space up here. Uh, what happened to them was that they fell into a tub of, um, I think it was some kind of tub, possibly of boiling water or very hot milk. They may have been pasteurizing the milk. They just called it a tub of hot wash. And this boy called Thomas Cumbarton, who was the son of a respectable merchant, again, this term respectable, from North King Street. And he was only nine years old. And he'd obviously gone down to the dairy yard to have a bit of a look around in 146 Church Street. And he fell into this tub of hot wash and he was terribly scalded. And he was taken to the Richmond Hospital, which was just up the road. So if you go up Church Street, you come to the Richmond Hospital. But uh, sadly, he died and an inquest was held at one force at, at Richmond Hospital uh, into his body. So that's a sad story which took place in 146 Church Street in 1851. And uh, subsequently, it seems that the dairy yard must have been removed and a, a building was put up to replace it on 146 Church Street. And that was used, uh, that was a, a premises of Patrick Hanratty who sold uh, old goods, he sold um, uh, old iron, and he also sold other rags. So Patrick Hanratty was a rag and bone man there in the 1880s, early 1890s. But that was a long time after it had been a dairy yard and this accident happened to poor Thomas C Cumbarton. So that's 146. And then if we move on to 147, which is round about here, um, 147 seems to have been a tenement. So it looks like this one is probably one of the original Dutch billies. And um, I don't know what it was originally used for. A lot of these were, as I say, um, shops and the family lived in very comfortable apartments above. But uh, over time, there was a decline. And particularly in the second half of the 19th century, uh, most of the merchant families had moved out and the houses were divided into tenements. So you might still have shops below, but the shops wouldn't be as good a quality as they had been in the past. And the upstairs would be occupied by families. And uh, we do have a few bits of information about 147 Church Street, and that seems to have been almost wholly let in tenements uh, by the uh, mid 19th century, because we find it described as a lodging house. But in 1866, there's a reference in the Dublin Daily Express. It's an advertisement placed by the medical officer in the North City Dispensary. And it references people who have been left destitute as a result of the cholera in the Church Street area. And one of the people mentioned lived at 147 Church Street, and she was the orphan daughter of a Mrs. Campion. So this shows that, uh, you know, the cholera had obviously affected the Church Street area uh, in 1866. We think of cholera as being with the famine, but in fact, it seems to have been still coming back and forth in 1866. And this poor girl was left destitute and she was being referenced by the medical officer um, in his letter. So uh, then the next information that we have about the occupants of 147 uh, actually involves a domestic dispute on this street that runs down beside the law library, which is known as May Lane. And it's a domestic dispute between a couple called the Sharkies. And the Sharkies lived in one of the, the houses or flats, the tenements at 147 Church Street. And uh, a dispute between the Sharkies ended up in the Dublin police court where uh, Mrs. Sharkey appeared in the witness box with her forehead covered with sticking plaster. And she said that she had met her husband in Hammond Lane. It was actually Hammond Lane, apologies, she met him in, which is just a bit closer to the Four Quits than May Lane, but it's close enough to the law library buildings in Church Street or where they were. Um, so Mrs. Sharkey had met her husband in Hammond Lane and she'd asked him for some money. And he said that he didn't have any money to give her, but he would blacken her eyes and he then struck her cutting her severely and her injuries were visible in the witness box where she had sticking plaster on her wounds. And she said that he'd frequently assaulted her, but she never complained to him before. They had 10 children. And she said that he, he never gave her any money. He had been out of work and she had supported him for five weeks. And then, you know, when um, he got well again, she looked for some money off him and he wouldn't give it to her. And when she persisted, he hit her. <laughs> 
So uh, Mr. Sharkey, on the other hand, told a different story. He said that his wife had spent all the money on drinks. So you have this conflicting situation, as you still have in domestic disputes today, where one spouse says one thing and the other another. But certainly at the magistrate, Mr. O'Donnell in the Dublin police court was sympathetic to Mrs. Sharkey because he sentenced her husband to um, six months with hard labour. And Mr. Sharkey's last words on being removed from the court was, were, God forgive you, woman, to his wife. So he was still maintaining that she wasn't telling the truth. So who knows uh, what the real story was in relation to the Sharkeys. So we had a lot of violence in fact between in families in this era. So you again get in 1899. Another resident of 147 Church Street in the Dublin, in the Northern Police Court, as they called it, which would have been cut close by just behind the forecourts. And he was charged with assaulting his mother-in-law. And he was again sentenced to a number of months imprisonment with hard labour. So you can see from this that 147 Church Street at this time anyway, probably wasn't the happiest of places with a lot of people in difficulty and stress there. And uh, in the 1880s, in fact, it had been held by the Northern Police Court to be unfit for purpose as a building and various works had to be done to it. And then subsequently there was held to be a nuisance there as well. So from the sounds of it, not only were the people living there in a bad way, but uh, it wasn't very well kept. So clearly the area was declining. 147 Church Street uh, is evidence of that decline. And that it was, as I said, situated approximately where uh, the, the arbitration rooms are uh, in Church Street. So if we move over then to 146 Church Street, uh, which is where the reception desk in the law library now stands approximately, uh, we have a slightly more joyful history for 146 Church Street. Um, because uh, that was originally a grocer's in the early 19th century run by a gentleman called Mr. Clark. Um, but unfortunately, Mr. Clark went insolvent uh, uh, again, representing the decline in the merchant class of Church Street during this period. And there was an interesting legal dispute as to whether or not uh, the property, the, the leasehold interest in, uh, in 148 uh, um, Church Street, whether it actually belonged to Mr. Clark and it passed to his assignee on insolvency, or whether instead it was part of property that was held on trustees under his marriage settlement. So uh, the, the uh, assignee in insolvency took out an advertisement putting up 148 Church Street for sale in 1837, and the trustees of Mr. Clark's marriage settlement took out a counter advertisement uh, saying that um, they, um, they objected to this and it wasn't for the assignee in bankruptcy to sell, or insolvency to sell this property because it didn't form part of uh, the insolvency. So there was a bit of a dispute there. And subsequently, ejectment proceedings had to be brought um, in the uh, in the at the Court of Common Pleas uh, for recovery of possession of 148 Church Street. And this was brought by the assignee and insolvency, Jim Crow, uh, to recover possession from one of the trustees of the marriage settlement, Mr. Dignan. And it seems that Mr. Dignan didn't turn up on the day, presumably he didn't have a very good case, and that Mr. Crow did, in fact, get possession back of 148 Church Street. So what happened then is that 148 Church Street was then let out as a meeting room. So there were quite a few interesting bodies that met there. So um, most famously, it was known as John Byrne's Great Rooms because John Byrne was the person who owned this premises, who'd acquired it from Jim Crow, I think. The, the, and uh, he, in John Byrne's Great Rooms, there was a meeting in 1842. It was a general meeting of the bakers of the city of Dublin. And they passed a resolution in relation to their working hours. Uh, they said that they had been required to work um, effectively. Uh, they had required to work uh, through the night. They had been required to start work at eight o'clock in the evening and continue to work until eight o'clock the following morning. In fact, actually, it was worse than that. They were complaining they'd been compelled to work for 24 hours from eight o'clock in the evening to eight o'clock the following evening. And they said they had intervals of rest so short that it was but a mockery of rest. So imagine having to work 24 hour shift. That's what the bakers of the city of Dublin had to do in 1842 when they passed this resolution at a meeting that took place in 148 Church Street. Uh, 
And after that, 148 Church Street was registered as a public lodging house in 1856. So again, it became tenements effectively. And uh, you had a number of reports again about the inhabitants of 148 uh, uh, Church Street. Uh, some of them got uh, in the newspapers, uh, got in the Dublin police, uh, police court um, as, uh, as um, uh, criminals. And some got in, the, got in the news for being in the Dublin police court as victims. So uh, in 1882, there was a lady called Maria Dignan who lived at 148 Church Street, and uh, she had her pocket picked on Church Street when she was going down Church Street one Tuesday afternoon. And uh, she felt a hand in her pocket, and on putting her hand there, she discovered that her purse was gone. And three men called Burke, McAvoy and Madden were brought up and they were charged um, uh, with having stolen from Maria Dignan. And um, the charges against them were struck out because of issues in relation to the identification. So in 1889, then, we had another story about an inhabitant of 148 Church Street. And this was a gentleman called, uh, he was a dairyman, and he was called Thomas Morn. So again, that illustrates there were still dairies that were taking place in the Church Street area. And Thomas Morn uh, was reported to have been taken again to the Richmond Hospital. Uh, so if you were injured in Church Street in the 19th century, you usually, usually ended up being taken to the Richmond. And Thomas Morn was taken to the Richmond, uh, suffering from a fracture of the leg uh, caused by a fall down some stairs. So uh, that's the story of 148 Church Street. Um, so if we move on then, to 149 Church Street. We're heading now over towards the entrance to the Law Library building in 145, uh, 151 Church Street. So we're about here. So if we head over there, uh, this was what was known as the repeal reading rooms for the Church Street Ward. So it was the repeal reading rooms. And uh, that meant that the organization that was promoting repeal under the auspices of Daniel O'Connell, they had their reading rooms there to support the repeal campaign. And the wardens of the Four Courts Ward and the committee of the parish were also based at, at, uh, um, uh, at, uh, um, at, at 149 uh, Church Street. So it was a, an important official location for Church Street. And fittingly, it is the very entrance of the, the law library buildings in Church Street. And just one other thing to mention about 149 Church Street, uh, there was a hurricane that hit Dublin in 1852 and the roof of a small house at the back of uh, 149 Church Street was blown down. Uh, uh, and uh, fortunately, only one man was slightly injured. But again, hurricanes were a feature of Dublin uh, throughout the 19th century. And later, 149 Church Street, obviously it was no longer the repeal reading rooms after the death of Daniel O'Connell because the repeal came to an end then. So then it became an auction office and uh, the, there was various silks and goods that were sold in the auction office. Um, and there were tenements above uh, 149 Church Street, and again, a very sad case involving a child who was taken to the Richmond, uh, which occurred in 1853, a three-year-old child by the name of Patrick Brown, and he was taken to the Richmond, uh, and he died there, sadly, from the effects of a burning that he had received the previous day in his home at 149 Church Street. So it looks like he was living above this auction office in a tenement with his parents. So very sad. And I mean, that reflects the high rate of infant mortality and it reflects the high rate of accidents to children uh, in those days in Dublin. So it illustrates the need possibly for the rigid health and safety rules that we have today. The, you know, without them, this is the kind of thing that was happening. So uh, then we move on and we go to 150. Um, uh, Church Street and 150 Church Street was very well known. 150 Church Street, which is just the premises that is not right beside May Lane, but that is next to it. Uh, that was a very, very well known and profitable pub, which benefited hugely from its location close to the Dublin police courts. And also Church Street at that time was the main road from Dublin to Glasnevin. So it was a very well known pub. There were a number of different people who occupied it. Um, so it started off run by Mr. Peter Kelly in the mid 19th century. Uh, he ran a grocer and spirit dealing business. 
And uh, then uh, his leasehold interest was put up for sale in 1874, and uh, it was uh, sold to uh, a gentleman by the name of um, of Joseph Brady, and it became Brady's Public House. So Public House, it would have been very well known in the locality. It would be a place where people would have come to uh, congregate and meet, and probably had looked maybe a little bit like this Public House of the period in an illustration by Dickens. So the Public House was first known as Brady's Public House, Sylvester Bra Joseph Brady, then it was taken over briefly by Sylvester Doyle, Francis Conway ran it for a few years, and then it became Kennedy's house under Michael Kennedy. So it was extremely profitable, we know this from the advertisements in relation to it. But why did it change hands so often? <laughs> and one reason might have been that the custom could sometimes be quite difficult. So it was extremely popular, but probably because of its location in an area that was um, uh, becoming very disadvantaged, and also because it was so close to the police courts, there seemed to be constant trouble there. Um, so, uh, for instance, um, in a, a Patrick Bates was charged with breaking all the windows and various bits and pieces of glass there in 1893. And then later, George Creighton was convicted of using violent and abusive language to Francis Conway. And uh, subsequently, uh, there were various watches that were stolen uh, from the shop also on Christmas Eve from the public house belonging to Mr. Conway. And I think a woman had her face cut with a glass there in 1900. So it was kind of a rough enough place, uh, this public house, uh, which existed in the second half of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, known alternately as Brady's, Doyle's, Conway's and Kennedy's public house. And that was at 150 Church Street, but apparently it made a lot of money. So now we come on to the final uh, building, which is 151 Church Street, and this was a pawn shop. So in the second half of the 19th century, we know this was a pawn shop because in 1884, uh, two boys, both by the name of Patrick Smith, were charged before the Dublin police court with having stolen a shirt from a premises in North King Street and pawned it there. Um, and uh, so that's the, the final building, which is 151 uh, Church Street. So um, you can see, just to recap, you have a dairy yard originally, then you have tenements, and then you have um, a, a meeting room that subsequently also becomes tenements, and you then have a public house and pawn shop. So that's what the block consisted of. Uh, and they are all the premises that make up the block 145 to 151 Church Street. And some of them really right up until the early 20th century. Some of them had been pulled down and rebuilt, but some of them were actually the original Dutch billies that were put up um, in, the, um, in the, the, the 18th century or maybe even earlier. So big change for this block around 1900. Um, uh, it, it, shortly after 1900, um, uh, in the first decade of the 20th century, all the houses were purchased by Jamisons. So Jamison had a distillery behind. I'm just going to show you just an illustration there. So there are the buildings as they were. Uh, you can see the church up there and you can see the, the, the various buildings, 145 to 151 Church Street there. This is around 1908, not long, uh, uh, or around the time Jamison purchased. And you can see the Jamison building behind. So they already had purchased a lot of property on Bow Street and now they were acquiring uh, the, the buildings here in front. And in 1911, all of these buildings were demolished by Jamisons. Uh, so none of the original Dutch buildings remained, even in the, you know, even, even, even prior to the Law Library building. Any buildings with that were demolished to build the Law Library building were modern buildings that would, relatively modern buildings that would have been put up in the early 20th century. But the demolition of these old Dutch buildings in 1911 resulted in a tragedy. And the tragedy was the death of a man called Henry Bambrick. And Henry Bambrick died um, as a result of injuries caused in the process of demolishing 145 to 151 Church Street. Um, what happened was that poor Mr. Bambrick was employed as a watchman 
he was employed as a watchman and he was employed as a watchman to keep passers-by away from the demolition that was occurring. So he was standing in May Lane and he was kind of, you know, keeping passers-by away. And one of the houses that was being demolished fell on him and he suffered severe injuries uh, to his legs and he then died. So there was quite a fuss about it because there was much criticism at the inquest about the way in which Jamison had conducted this demolition and that they hadn't employed a competent contractor and they hadn't supervised it and so forth. Um, so I don't know how it ended. I mean, there wasn't a huge uh, amount of negligence actions in those days, but certainly there was a lot of criticism of John Jamison and Sons at the inquest into poor Mr. Bambrick's death. So subsequently, there were new houses erected afterwards, and you can see them here. This is a painting by Patrick Swift. It's actually a painting. Uh, it's actually, just see if I can, yeah. So I found it on whites. It's actually a painting that focuses really on the earlier block, but you can just see the new houses that were put up there on 145151 Church Street. You can see they were much smaller houses than these ones, which would have been older. They, they were put up after uh, the, the, uh, the demolition. So you see them there. So you can see just on the corner, uh, these new houses that were put up, which the older houses back there are quite different from these newer houses. Uh, and these houses there at the end, they survived until more or less around the time the law library was built. Uh, so I have some photos, which I'll show again, of Church Street in the 20th century, the 1970s. And you see some of these uh, buildings uh, survive. Um, so again, if you see this map, this is from the mid 19th century. So you can see uh, there, I've lost it a bit now. Um, Yes, yeah, so you can see just Church Street running up there and you can see May Lane and you see there was a block there, uh, some of the part of the distillery and there were there was at least one separate building there on the corner. Um, but it, these were, as I say, weren't the original Dutch Billies. So if we look up Church Street today, I've kind of tried to show you um, uh, Patrick Swift's picture. So you can see there St. Mitchell's Church, and then you can see another new building there. And just a little bit further on is the building we're talking about, the white building here, 145 to 151 Church Street. And again, you can see in Swift's image there, Again, St. Mitchin's Church, this block here, all now gone. And then you have uh, 145 to 151 Church Street, as it was in 1948, when Patrick Swift did this uh, a lovely piece of art. So I leave you with that. It's been very nice talking to you about the history of 145 to 151 Church Street. It's a much interesting older history from medieval times, but I'm not going to explore that today. This is just about these buildings and how they were covered in the news reports in the 19th and early 20th century. So thanks for listening. Very much appreciate it. Uh, thank you.